Let's take our Bibles this morning. Revelation, the book of Revelation. Chapter number 2. Chapter number 2. You guys have it. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. If you're able and are, uh, would like to stand, we like to stand here as we read the Bible together out loud. And it was done in the Old Testament out of respect for the Word of God. Yeah. I'm not saying you don't have respect if you don't stand. I understand. Some of us can't. I'm getting there myself. <laughs> I'm tired this morning. I hope I can stand long enough to preach a message. But Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Let's read together. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and cast and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful to be in this house today. And Lord, we do have freedom right now in our state and in our nation to come and to worship and to praise your name. Lord, days of persecution could lie ahead. I don't know. Only you know those answers. But I do know this. We're here today. We want to preach the Word of God. We want to encourage people to live for you. We want anyone in this room that may not know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that today things will be different when we leave for every one of us. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you'll excuse me, I'll drink a little bit of water here. So here's an interesting passage. It's probably been preached thousands of times. How many of you have heard a sermon before on leaving your first love? Huh? Most of you? Over, over half of you? Some of you didn't, though. That's interesting. This morning's message is warm hands, but cold hearts. Warm hands, but cold hearts. We're living, of course, today when things are so different, even in our Baptist churches. Baptists used to be known for their fanaticism on the Bible. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And now they don't even know which Bible to use, a lot of them. Uh, They don't know what the Bible really is. They haven't studied the history of the Bible. Anything that comes on the bookshelf that makes it easier for them, they think, to understand, they switch to. Uh, We here at this church and myself, we've always been King James only. King James is the Word of God we understand, I believe, throughout history. You can research it yourself. It is the seventh English translation. It is uh, the seventh revision of that original translation. The Bible says the words of God will be purified seven times seven and uh, preserved forever. And if we don't have the Word of God in our hands, then what are we going to church for? I mean, really, you think about it. What's the point? If we're not here to learn the Bible and what God tells us, and we have to change what it says, something's wrong. And I could spend all morning talking about that, but that's not my, not my message today. But we do live in a time when, when churches have changed. Also here, if you read in Revelation, he's going to describe seven churches uh, that, he, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself addresses over issues in the church. Uh, some people will say there are seven church ages. I think that's a bunch of baloney because there's nothing in the Bible that calls them seven ages. 
Each church is addressed as a local church. Matter of fact, if you study this out, you'll understand there really is no such thing as a universal church. It doesn't exist. That's a lie from the Catholic Church. The Catholic means universal. And they want folks to be drawn into this universalism. And it really is nothing but a de detriment to understanding the Bible because it changes everything around, puts things in perspective. And so this church is an independent church. The Lord Jesus Christ is our head. Amen? And you see this here. The Christ is the head of these seven different churches. And he knows what's going on. I want you to know today that the Lord Jesus Christ knows what goes on at West Coast Baptist Church and with her members. We as a church are a bride of Christ. And we belong to him. We have been espoused to him, just as Mary was espoused to Joseph, promised, we have been promised to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, the rapture is going to take place, and we're going to meet Christ in the air, and we're going to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't have time to go further into that, but this kind of gives you an idea. Ephesus was a powerful city in its day, located near the Aegean Sea, had a large harbor for commercial trade, and it was considered a free city under Roman rule. In other words, Rome let the city be free. And, uh, but however, there were many, many religions, and they were all allowed to be there. But that does include the, the home of the Temple of Diana. And that's a wicked, vile place. It's one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, was at Ephesus. Uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ sent Paul there on his mission trip, and he started a church. And we believe from the scriptures, it shows us that Timothy was the first pastor there at Ephesus. And uh, it's tremendous stories if you read it and understand what the history, all the history behind it. Uh, so really, it was much like America in comparison. The trade and the commerce and all the stuff going on. And uh, so what's happened here in this city is people have gotten complacent. The church itself has lost this direction. Look at the world today. Really, haven't churches lost their direction? How many churches are really interested in seeing a true biblical revival in this nation? See, biblical revival cannot come from things that are not biblical. So, you know, they're thinking, well, we're getting all these numbers, but here's the problem. Just recently, one of the mega churches in America, one of the first ones to get other folks to go that direction, the pastor has admitted that over half his congregation are not saved. And he has repented of his methods. And what he did is he took surveys of everybody that lived in his area and uh, what 10 things do you want in church? And he took all those cards from all those homes that they dropped off the cards to, tallied them up, and they put the top 10 things in his church. Hence, laser lights and rock and roll music, uh, easier to understand Bible versions, no hard preaching, sermons that are no more than 20 minutes. You know, I mean, you, you name those things, and that's what they did. And they did. They got a big crowd. They had traffic directing everybody in. I, I saw a cartoon recently on Facebook. It was really hilarious, and it, but it's the sad truth is... Here's a church, and on the sign it says, preaches the word of God without compromise. And there's just a few people going in. And then they had the, the church of, of the now, <laughs> and everybody was just pouring in the doors. You know what happens to those churches? In a few years, they die. They're, they're no longer in existence. So here we see Christ is addressing this church at Ephesus and dealing with the problem. First, let's look at the positive. Aren't you glad that when God looks at us, he also looks at the positive? <laughs> he does see the good things. He looked at this church, and uh, we see the witness of the church. He begins with words of encouragement. In verse 2, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So he talked about their works, uh, things that they have accomplished for the glory of God. In our church, we can look at the things that God has allowed us in this church to accomplish. And then also we see uh, the labor that was done, actually working to the point of exhaustion. 
We have had members in our church over the years that really work hard. I mean hard. And they, they, they're diligent in their work. When we get these buses rolling, you'll be able to tell which bus captains work hard. You know why? Their buses will be successful. Um, we'll see which ones are really willing to work. Sunday school teachers, if you just kind of pull something out of the hat to teach in your Sunday school and you don't labor, you don't study, you're not going to be successful. But these people were hard workers, and I know that's a, a, a word that's, uh, and labor is missing in today's society. Nobody wants to work. Everybody wants to get paid. Nobody wants to work, right? And uh, then we see what they did is they served at every opportunity. They, were, uh, they didn't stop no matter the opposition. I think this is a pretty good description of our church right now. A lot of us have worked hard. We have worked hard over the many, many years. I've been here for all 47 years, and I've seen a lot of people sacrifice and do a lot of things in order that the work can go forward. Right now we have a Spanish, a man, he's up in the Spanish ministry right now that's going on, and I don't even know how it is. How does your grandpa, uh, 74, he just lost his wife a few months ago, a couple months ago. He comes out here. He's been in Mexico uh, visiting. He just got back, and he's here all day, several days of the week in the hot sun. He's weeding. He's uh, raking. He's cutting. He's doing everything he can do to make the church look beautiful. And we've had many people over the years, Brother Danny now in heaven. Danny, y'all don't know this, Danny would come and work hard. And he was suffering from fibromyalgia and all kinds of illnesses. And we'd see him tumble and fall. One day he was up here to about cut his hand off uh, because he fell over from exhaustion and and the the problems that he had. Uh, So we've had a lot of people work hard. We've had bus captains work hard. I mean, we've had it. Um, They don't, and then we don't give in to the liberals. Folks, haven't we been through a lot with that? Think about it. People that come in the church and they want to change the church. Church has been this way these years. We've stayed truthful to the word. We've stayed truthful with our music. We try to serve God in every way we can. And the devil sends them in, doesn't he? But you have stood the test. A sacrificing church. We need to be a sacrificing church. Then secondly, uh, she was a separated church in verse 2. Uh, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. In verse 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus Christ did not like false prophets. Church, we have stood firm, haven't we, on doctrine? We had one man come in the church one day, and he says, let me show you in the Bible here, Pastor, what it says about the the seal six and trump number six and all this stuff. And I said, get out. He said, what? Get out. You're not a member here, and you're not going to come in my church and teach heresy. I knew what he was trying to do. He's trying to twist the scriptures to tell us there is no rapture. We will not be taken out. We're going to go through the tribulation. And he was trying to change everything about our doctrine. And most of you, if you'd have been there with me, you'd have said, amen, preacher. Want me to take him out for you? You know? So we have taken hard stands. We still stand for the King James, even though it's not popular. We still stand for the hymns. We still stand for doctrine, truth in doctrine. We want to be holy, don't we? We want to be pure. That's what this church was doing, uh, taking hard stand. The Nicolaitan, what they believed is Nic- uh, Nicola- Nicholas was teaching that um, you're saved by grace. So you can live like the devil because you're saved by grace. Remember how the Bible says not to use your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness? You don't have the right to go out and live like the world and be the world and be sinful just because you're saved. Well, I can't lose it. Well, that's not... I've had people throw that up at me when they believe they can lose theirs, but I've always noticed something. They live looser than I live. They do things that I would never do as a Christian And they accuse me of, of, you know, grace, 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 it's not right. Free, 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 it's not right. It is right. But if you have it, you don't want to live that way. I don't want to. And that's what the problem was. Can you imagine? And that's what we hear today, by the way. Isn't that what the churches are teaching for the most part? Eh, come on to church, look like you want to look. You don't have to change. 
All you have to do is ask Jesus in your heart and you'll be all right. You'll be saved. And they never tell them how to live a separated life. The reason our country is where she is is because Christians, our so-called Christians, are not living a separated holy life out in the world. There's no difference between the average Christian today than the average sinner. I was talking to one this week and he was talking about how active he is in church. And he told me, well, I've been... uh, uh, I'm making beer at home now. I got a thing to do making beer at home. I got a neighbor across the street doing the same thing. He says he's a Christian, goes to church every week, gave me a testimony of salvation, but he's got a, I didn't know it was legal. He's got it inside his garage. Everybody can see him. He's in there making booze. Used to be never named among Christians to drink booze. We understood that. Now universities that are supposed to be Baptist universities are giving in. My old college, my old college, Baptist College in Virginia, they had students on campus protesting for gay rights. Found out some were gay. Now, when I was there, they would come see you and love and say, Brother, you need to repent of this. Amen. If you don't, you got to leave. Amen. I heard this morning that now they have a policy that if you have a drug problem, you can tell them, and they will help you, but no punishment will be given. That's not what sin's about. Listen, I don't feel sorry for drug addicts. I did not take drugs, number one, because I'm a Christian. I've never experimented with drugs. I got saved from all that. I don't have to do all that stuff. And now it's become the accepted thing. And so that's what the Nicolaitans, they were saying, well, you're saved anyway, you're saved by grace. It's okay to live and be like everybody else. That's not true. That's not biblical. So this church was good. They stood firm. Um, (coughs) These people had powerful influences, and obviously you see that it has taken effect all across our country. You know, it used to be in our country, whether you were a Methodist or a Baptist or a, a Church of Christ, we all understood one thing. When you got saved, you repented. Your life changed. No longer that way. This church was also a steadfast church. In verse 3, And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Even though the work was hard, the opposition was strong, they stuck with the stuff and they kept going. I wonder today why all my friends that I went to college with, almost every one of them have gone neo-evangelical. They went to the same school I went to, sat under the same preaching and professors I had, and in those days we had uh, chapel services. Now they call them convocation services. And now, they, you know, they had Melania, Melania, Melania Trump, that's her name, Miss, Mrs. Trump was there, and she spoke for chapel, you know. And they have all these other politicians, and today they had a thing about drugs, awareness, and all this stuff. None of it now in their church, in that place, it has to do with hard preaching. When I was there, they brought in preachers that skinned alive. Now, I don't know about you as a Christian, I like hard preaching. I like a man to come, open up the Word of God, and challenge me. He said, Thus saith the Lord, what's your problem? Right? I need to correct. I want to be corrected. I want to be taught. And so that's what we see going on today. But this church was steadfast. So praise God for this church at Ephesus there. Now let's look at the weakness of the church. Then the Lord Jesus tells them, Nevertheless, in verse 4, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So they had, good, they had a good witness. They worked. They, they took the right stands. You know, it's possible to be a good husband but not love your wife. It's possible to be a good wife and not really love your husband. You can do all the right things, even say the right things. But if you don't love with that emotion in that heart, then the love is missing. I hear stories all the time about people that have endured loveless relationships entire lives, never once ever finding the love that they should have for one another. And that's our problem today with a lot of us. We go to a good church, we take the right positions, 
we do some work for the Lord and do all these other things and we look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, don't smoke, drink, or chew or any of that other stuff or go with those that do. But you don't have the love for Christ you once had. You left. Remember how it was when you first got saved? For me, I, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I was 10 years old and now I'm 66, so that was, what, 56 years ago. And I can still remember vividly what took place that night. And I can remember letting go of that pew and running down the aisle and receiving Christ as my Savior. And I've often said, I believe I got saved the minute I released the pew. Because every service, I would just hold on like that, just get white knuckles, and I was, not, I was fighting God. But the day I got saved, I let go of that pew, I ran down that aisle, I fell on my knees at the altar, and the Lord Jesus Christ saved me. And the next day I had to tell everybody, oh man, I got saved last night. My public school teacher didn't know what I was saying. My bus driver didn't know what I was talking about. I wish I had tracks back then. And I was just, I was motivated. I couldn't wait to get baptized. People say they're saved and don't want to get baptized. Why? That's the first step. I had no trouble. Woo! Time to get baptized now. But there have been periods in my life where I lost that zeal. You know, you can get in the ritual of doing things. Uh, you can prepare sermons and read the Bible even and pray and still not have that love that you should have. And that's what had happened to this church. They were doing the right stuff, but they weren't doing it with love. Uh, I could tell my wife this week, I want a banana cream pie this week. Would you make me a pie? And that would be a good pie. It's always been a good pie. She's never failed me yet. It's always delicious. My sugar count wouldn't like it right now, so I can't have it, honey. But you know what tastes better? It's when you get done with your meal and you haven't asked for a pie and you're just sitting there getting ready to get up. So, oh, Stacy, I got something for you. And she pulls out the pie. That's a much better pie than the one I asked her, told her to make. Why? Because it was made with love. Y'all understand? That's the way we're supposed to serve the Lord. And out knocking on doors yesterday is exciting and that's good. But imagine if you did it with the full love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were doing it not because you have to, but you're doing it because you love the Lord. Amen. You know what the world needs to see? They, the world needs to start seeing Christians who really love God. You know, people look at you today and they just, eh. It's because Christians have lost their real love of Jesus. You remember how we've read in the Bible in 1 John chapter 5 how that God's commandments are not grievous? Meaning they're not hard, they're not difficult. We talked about that not that long ago. If you love someone, it's not hard, is it? My wife won't submit to me. Well, maybe there's a love problem here somewhere. Maybe you're a brute master. You're not loving your wife like you should. And we lose our effectiveness as Christians because the world understands if you love God or not. So you can do all the right things. Let's, uh, let's think of babies. I love babies. Y'all know that. I love children. Children are such a blessing, aren't they? Especially grandkids. Oh, my. There's nothing better. I'm all excited for uh, Shannon and Sharon's home. They got their first grandchild, their only grandchild, that they'll probably have. Well, they may get more. And uh, so they had a baby this week. Little Caitlin, our little Caitlin grew up here, actually got a baby now. And uh, her and her husband are rejoicing in the Lord. But to look at their faces and see the change on Shannon's face, I mean, he, he's usually just real somber all the time. Man, he's just grinning from ear to ear holding that baby. It's exciting, isn't it? And what is it that a baby needs? You, you know, you can provide all the food and all that and still lose it with the kid. They need love. Children need to, to know that they're loved and cared for. Sometimes that little annoying kid that you have around you won't leave you alone. They're looking for love. You need to make sure that they understand you love them. A lot of disobedience is due to the lack of love. And they understand when you spank them because you love them. When you discipline, you love them. 
whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Do you see the whole thing? Love is the key, is it not? God is love. Isn't that what the Bible says? We used to sing those songs when I was a little kid. Uh, something like, uh, love him, love him, all you little children, God is love, God is love. And we'd sing, serve him, serve him, all you little children, God is love, God is... And we, we've actually lost that. I hear a lot about love, but is it really love they're talking about? So if you love them, it changes your whole behavior. Let me get focused here. So we see the weakness of the church. They had left this love. So then three, we see not only the weakness of the church and the witness of the church, we see the warning of Christ. In verse 5, he says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. You need to remember. He talks about remembrance. One thing you need to do on a regular basis is mentally rehearse your salvation testimony. When we have salvation testimonies in the church or we ask for a praise time, a lot of people will never stand up. You're missing out. You know what it does to refresh your mind and get you motivated when you talk about your salvation experience? Remember where you were. Some of you today could say all kinds of things about, I used to do drugs and I used to drink and I used to do these other wicked things. Now you don't want to glorify sin, but it's good to remember where you used to be. Amen. Where were you before you got saved? Think about it. Boy, talk about stirring up your love for Christ. Where would you be today if Christ hadn't saved you? You know what the cure for divorce and all these other issues is? Is for two people to be saved and love the Lord. If both of you love the Lord, you'll get through your marriage. Amen. You take love out of that picture with Christ, you don't have love for Christ, you're not going anywhere with your home. You see, he reminds them, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember what it was like when you were on fire for Christ. He's saying, church, remember you did all these things? Remember it. Remember it when the Baptists used to be busy all the time. Remember instead of having two buses, which we now had none before, we got two buses now. Remember we had one time seven buses. <coughs> Can you imagine what that was like? Who else was here when we had seven buses? Well, probably about a little less than a third of them. Remember that? Huh? Remember Annie? She's been serving in our children's Sunday school 30 some odd years? Huh? 35 years ago. She came, by the way, with the buses. Her daughter came on the buses, and you came on the buses, and she hooked up with my mother. My mother helped disciple her. She became my mom's assistant in the primary class. And for years, even till today, 35 years later, she's still working with primaries. She can tell you there were times we had 120, 130 primaries. That's just kids from the age of uh, first grade, second grade, and third grade. People that you leave your first love and you remember, you forget what it was like. I remember. I remember seeing 700 folks at church. How is it that people lose their first love? Remember what, what it used to be like. And then in verse 5, he says, and repent. Repent. You know, a lot of you could do a lot of good in your marriage if you would just say, honey, please forgive me, I was wrong. You know what you do for your marriage? If y'all Do you men apologize to your wives when you lose your cool? Now, me, I don't lose my cool with my wife. No, I have to eat, uh, what do they call it, eat crow a lot. Huh? You know what we need to do? We need to fall on our faces before a holy God in heaven and repent. Everything else has become more important to us than the things of Christ. Somebody think, well, if I devote more time to my marriage, that's what it is. I need to. That's a lie from hell. You have plenty of time for your home and your marriage.
Nobody's breaking their necks around here to just do all for God and nothing for the home. If nothing's being done for you at home, then that's another issue. We need to find out why. He warns, he said, look, you need to repent. Remember? Some of you used to be bus runners. Y'all remember what those were, guys? How many kids that, well, be young people now that used to be bus runners? Becky was. Rachel was. Andrew was when he was here. Uh, who else? I used to drive a bus. I drove a 1958 Ford bus with a split rear, and this has one of those little triggers on here on your shift. As you shift gears, you have half gears as you go through it. And uh, Kevin Wynn was a bus captain. My wife was the secretary, and I was the driver. And I got the point that the things I was doing in church, I couldn't drive the route anymore. I want, I want to drive now, and I can't. The doctor says, nope, you can't get your certification to drive passengers anymore. I miss it. Wives, don't hinder your man from serving God with a bus route. You want to be with him? Throw your kids on the bus, and you go too. I've had, I've had bus workers uh, fix um, child seats in the bus. You have, you're perfectly free to bolt those things down and make them safe. It doesn't, doesn't bother me one bit to have a safe bus. For, but I tell you what does bother me is when people try to keep other people from serving God. Imagine what we could do. We need to repent. Then he also says you need to return, return in verse 5, and do the first works. So the, the problem is, if you've lost your first love, you need to ask God's forgiveness, you need to turn from it, and you need to go back to what you used to do. What would happen in America if every church in America could go back to what they used to do? You know, when I was a, a little boy, I remember it just vivid and just always stuck in my mind, going to communities in the area. This was down in Tennessee. You know, they have a saying down south, there's a church on every corner. You know why that is? Because Christians were doing the first works. Church got established and they were doing good. They would take another man and go out and start another church. Brother Ben was part of that in his day when Ben could work. And uh, he was a member of what used to be Buena Vista Baptist Church. And they started North Vista Baptist Church. And they weren't, oh, oh, another church is going to start. We're going to lose everybody. No, they went out and they worked and helped the church get established. And they work together. Imagine that. You know, if you love Christ, you can work together. Amazing things were done. And the Baptists across the country in the 50s were starting church after church after church after church. And I moved to California in 1967 with my parents. He came here to take a church. And they were still starting churches. Imagine California, the Baptists were starting churches all over. I remember a time when you didn't have to have a church of of uh, 10,000, the real goal was to start individual churches. By the way, that's biblical. That's what they did in the book of Acts. They would start a church in there and then go over here and start a church, go over here and start a church, go over here and start a church, come back around, get refreshed, and go out and do it all over again. Do the first works. It's time that we do the things that God wants us to do. Get back to it. And maybe now you're like me at the age you can't do as much as you used to do, but you can do some things and you can help encourage those that need to. The problem today, real worship is no longer a priority for God's people. Do we go to church to feel good? Or do we go to church to worship God? We're supposed to come and sing praises to worship Him. The problem with most music today is it's carnal. It's fleshly. It makes the person doing it feel good. We need to have real worship. We can go days without prayer, without Bible study, or maybe even not even mention the Lord all week long until we come to church on Sunday. Then we also see he not only speaks of uh, remembrance and repentance and returning, but he speaks of removing in verse 5, he says, Or else I will come quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place. Now, we know a candlestick represents light. But what is it a symbol for here? You Bible scholars that know Revelation, what is a candlestick? 
The Bible answers that in chapter 1. No. No. The preacher. The preacher. We're supposed to realize that. We could lose the power of God on this church. We could lose the light, the leading of the Holy Spirit if we don't return to what God wants us to be. Um, here we are. Well, yeah, the seven, the, the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And it talks about the seven stars and the angels which are the pastors. All right. Let's move on. Then he speaks of redemption. Redemption. Aren't you glad there's redemption? He that hath an ear, in verse 7, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, not everybody was listening. Not everybody wants to listen to Christ and do what Christ says. But those that will, we have redemption. Now, I want you to look something. Look at uh, 1 John, I think it is, chapter 5. Uh, let's see here. Verse 5. Now, here's the thing. I've had people say, well, see, the Bible says you have to hold on to the end and be faithful. No, God holds on to us. We don't hold on to him. So is, who is he that overcometh? You know, the people don't understand. What does the Bible say? Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you've been saved, you will overcome this world. You ever worried, what are you going to do if the, if the tribulation starts and you see the beginnings of it before the rapture? There have been lots of tribulations in our world's history. They've killed Baptists for years. France, they were, the Catholic Church was afraid France was going to be overrun with Baptists. The Baptists had such good work going on, they were just killing them by the tens of thousands. We've had persecution. There's nothing to say we won't have it again right here in our own country. And to be quite frank, we're no better than any other Christian in history. Matter of fact, in some ways, we're far worse. We've been blessed beyond measure. We got a beautiful church, nice comfort and facilities. The early churches met in catacombs, the graveyards. In Russia, to this day, many of them still meet out in the forest. We had a Russian used to. They, I used to help that Russian church. It's now meeting on their own, and uh, we had a man in there that. Spent five years in prison for leading one hymn in Russia. He led one hymn out in the forest. They came and arrested him. So you think, well, I can't do this. If this happens to me, what am I going to do? All I can tell you is God's grace. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you haven't done it, I beg you, read the unabridged Fox's Book of Martyrs. Not the new one, because the new one is riddled with changes because the Catholic Church now owns the book. So they've changed it. So get the unabridged version. And you'll read in there stories that will just make you rejoice to know that your Savior will take care of you. Can you imagine one story talks about this dear lady she recanted. No, no, I, I'm not going to believe in Jesus anymore. But when she was taken out there, she said, I do believe in Jesus Christ. And I will not deny him. He has saved my soul. And I trust in Christ alone for salvation, not the Catholic Church. They tied her to the stake to burn her. And as she was burning and as flesh was falling off of her skin, she sang and rejoiced and praised God and did not scream in pain. Now, I can't promise you that's what you're going to have if you ever get through persecution, but I'm telling you, God will be with you. Amen. Did you know that thousands upon thousands were converted during that time? Just like the prisoners that were saved, excuse me, the guards that were saved when they had Paul as a prisoner. 
Many got saved. First man to carry the Baptist witness into England was way back in 160 something, I think, 80. And uh, he was saved by Paul in the prison, led to Christ. Quit being a, a Roman soldier, went back to his home country of England, took the gospel, and started the church work. So, God will be there. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Those of us today that are saved, we have the assurance that someday, someday, we will live forever with no sorrow or pain. Amen? And to live in the presence of God. Some of you, you don't like singing now. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Because we're going to sing. We're going to praise and we're going to rejoice. Let's stand together, please.